You know that saying about how the last few steps or distance or amount of time is always the longest? That was this build period because in reality there was no one single point of focus for the past three weeks. And I feel like that kind of contributed to this overall feeling of being worn out that I was feeling while staring at that proverbial wrench in my hand. So about a quarter of the way through this build period, I simply stepped back and took note of everything that needed to be done, and I stockpiled everything so I could just blaze through the tasks without doing everything piecemeal as things came into my possession. No new patrons this build period, but I would like to thank William Nolan for not only buying that old Luftmeister pipe, but also throwing in a little bit of extra money to help with the build. I used it to buy antifreeze and heat shrink. In fact, on the topic of Patreon, thank you to everyone who stuck with me over there. Right, so first things first, the gas tank. I had found what looked like little bits of rubber in the exhaust. I also wanted to strip the gas tank of the paint anyway, so step one was to drain the gas, and using the fuel pump itself basically made this step a breeze. Unfortunately, when I went to strip the paint, I had realized that the original red paint, primer, and clear was still under the new quote unquote black paint and primer. So it really fought back against the paint stripper that I was using. Thankfully, when I shared this to Instagram, Arcane Moto had come in super clutch and offered to chemically strip the tank for me. Now, who in their right mind would say no to that? So I left the paint alone and I just focused on the internals of the tank. Getting inside the tank is pretty much impossible with the gas cap on, so that's gotta come off first. After that, you can get your hand into it and remove whatever you're gonna take out and take it out through the top. Taking a look into the tank, you can see that seven month old gas. As you can see, there's also bits of rubber in there too. Anyway, three major components in the gas tank. Fuel pump, fuel level float and sender, and a fuel filter with the related hoses. The fuel filter didn't look particularly bad, nor did the hoses, but obviously they would be replaced anyway. The fuel float had seen better days in terms of rust, but I know it works because the gas light indeed worked when I was riding around on a stock bike. The ball at the end of the arm floats on the surface of the gas, and then the arm moves a resistor calibrated to ground an indicator light at a specific fuel level. Despite just how shitty it looks, I would have gladly reused it. However, this old sender has a design flaw where the wires have a serious stress point as they leave the body. The wires were completely jacked up at this point and would eventually fail, so even though this is another hit for $240, it was 100% necessary. The fuel pump was all good, but that screen was doing about as much filtering as a non-California biker. I mean, just look at it. The gas cap worked, but of course I would replace it with something that was better looking. The gas tank stuff was gonna be a pretty big bill, but I had to deal with it because, I mean, well, good luck running a bike without gas. With the tank gutted, the only thing left to do was to let it air out for a few days until my Arcane Moto appointment, where I handed the tank over to professionals for chemical stripping. Now, given that the plan was to run a raw aluminum gas tank, the natural thing to do would be to run a raw aluminum front fender. And I had my eyes on this one sold by Cognito Moto. Very nice, right? Beautiful. The thing is, once it was time to pull a trigger on this thing, which I wanted for a long time, I just, I couldn't bring myself to spend that much for a piece of bent metal. The thing that seriously kills me with this thing is that the regular fender with without the GSXR mounts is $160, while the one with the mounts is marked up to $325. That's a markup of 165 bucks, which is insane to me. <laughs> Absolute robbery for literally just what, what a metal sticks, you know? So in the end, I decided that I'll just run a stock GSXR fender, but I'd have to make it look like aluminum by using paint and uh, sandpaper to get a brushed effect. So before buying a stock GSXR fender, I ran a test on a K100 fender that was left over. I used some uh, cast aluminum colored paint that I used on the engine block. By intentionally giving the paint coat some imperfections, it actually looked pretty close to aluminum, but adding a brushed effect with a Brillo pad is what really did the trick. I was convinced, so I went ahead and ordered the GSXR Fender, the stock one, not the overpriced bullshit. Now let's talk radiators for a second. My radiator works just fine, but I always had my eyes on that radiator built by RC Racing in Italy, sold by BSK Speedworks. Real work of art, but 
again, I just can't justify spending $800 on this and then waiting two weeks for me to get it. So I went to the place where cheapskates go to die and I ordered a Chinese made radiator because really more than anything, I just wanted that radiator color. I didn't really care about the function, you know, that raw aluminum color. Thankfully, even though this radiator is Chinese, it's actually sold out of California, so it didn't take too long to get. Annoyingly, it came out of the box with some bent fins, and I'm not sure if this filler hole, uh, the filler cap hole should be half blocked the way it is. <laughs> but otherwise, it's definitely a radiator, and it looked reasonably nice. So, I mean, let's see if it leaks when it comes time to use it. Do you remember how at the end of the last episode, I mentioned that I need to clean up the wiring? Well, this is what I meant. Originally, I was going to use black electrical tape to kind of swap out all the crazy colors I used at the first time. But more than a few commenters had recommended something called Tessa tape. Tessa tape is basically that fuzzy stuff that you'll find in modern German cars for wiring harnesses. The great thing is that it's heat resistant, which was proven to me when I ran the bike later in this episode and it was actually a coil lead resting on the hot pipes while it was running the whole time. The Tessa tape is a, is a matte black, so it kind of hides the wires a lot more cleanly than a shiny vinyl tape, you know? Oh yeah, check it out, I got the strip gas tank back. But before I get to that, two things. One, take a look at how much more stealthy the exposed wires over the engine and under the gas tank look. Much better. I even cut off the excess hangers from the coils and painted them in a low gloss black. Very, very stealthy. The other thing, engine covers. The guys at RK Moto had come through with a nice matte black powder coat with polished fins, which is basically a must have for any flying brick. So, let's get these things on a brick, shall we?
Now if you replace your time and chain cover, you have to replace this crankshaft seal. The one you see in my hand isn't actually a new replacement one, it's the old one that I removed from the bike from the, uh, the old uh, cover, the one that I just took off. This seal is an example of the first generation rubber style seals, but BMW actually changed the design of the seal twice. The, the, the readily available one these days is a Teflon style seal that's actually a pain in the ass to install, but I'll get back to that later, just keep that in the back of your head. For now, I just left this hole unsealed since I wouldn't be running the bike yet anyway. It added a nice degree of finish to the bike. I still had to do the gas tank rushing, but it was getting a little bit dark, but check it out. Thanks to movie magic, bam, like the sun ain't never set, right? So the tank was stripped, but the aluminum finish wouldn't be uniform without some brushing and sanding. When I was trying to strip the paint myself, I had left some scratches that would need to be evened out before I started brushing it. I'm using a light rust and paint remover to scratch the tank for a mostly uniform and raw finish. But at the same time to give it those scratches to add a little bit of texture.
I had achieved that industrial look, but the winds had reached 30 miles per hour, which was rolling in unforecasted rain clouds for like 10 minutes at a time. So I had found myself going in and out between the rainfall, trying to get as much done as I could. I even threw the GSX-R fender in black onto the bike, and I'll be honest, I was kind of liking how it looked in black, so I settled on just shortening it and then repainting it in a matte black to match the rest of the bike. But very shortly after the winds had cut this wrench session short because they hit like 35 miles per hour and then 25 and only I can do that. At the beginning of the last episode I had mentioned that I took note of everything that was left to be done and I just took some time to order everything that was left. It was literally like a day or two where I went out before I had made the to-do list and I literally just stood there half frozen with no idea what to work on. There are some minor interdependencies here and there, and seeing everything laid out helped me unscramble my mind. The list was made in no particular order at all, but I think the gas tank would actually be a great place to start, so let's start there by coincidence. So right now I got all of my tank hardware in front of me and ready to go. Up here I got the fuel cap, so that's the, the top, it screws into the base right here. And then they give you two keys and some hardware to mount it to the tank. This, I think it's gonna look great because this, this got stripped, it looks pretty cool, but this looks way better. This is also the gasket. Uh, if you order it from uh, EME, Euromoto Electrics, they give you a free gasket with, uh, with, the, with the, the gas cap. This is the screen for the, the bottom of the pump, because if you remember, the other one is like completely broken on one of these quadrants. So one, one of these corners is like completely just ripped through. I don't know, I don't even know how that happened, but you know, who knows? This is the fuel float, which sucks because this thing costs like $240. And uh, I wouldn't even have replaced it if this didn't also have the wires for the for the fuel pump, which is like, you know, you can't not have a fuel pump. Uh, but since this is, uh, since I got all the wires and stuff and everything is good, since they improved the design, I'll probably see if I could run a gas light for whichever one is, uh, the, the lower one, I forget what, four liters? I think, I don't know, I don't remember. Got way too many hoses for <laughs> for, <laughs> for, what I, for what I need, but uh, you can only get them in, in a kit of, uh, I don't even know what this is, what is this, like 10? One, two, three, uh, who cares? Then you got two, also two came with the, uh, the fuel filter, the internal fuel filter. So, I mean, <laughs> I just have hose clamps for days. But uh, also got 15 inches of uh, submersible fuel hose. So this is what's gonna replace the, the hose that went to this uh, and also on this side. So you, you gotta cut it at a certain length to kinda replace this original setup that they have. So you just gotta cut it at the end and then add this on this side. So yeah, I'm gonna get ready to install all this stuff. Putting everything back in the tank was hands down the most fiddliest thing ever done on camera, and of course it's practically impossible to film.
The cool thing is that BMW used different sized rings and studs to denote the positive and negative connectors on a fuel pump. I was actually stuck trying to remember which one was which before I remembered that. When I went to install a gas cap, I very quickly realized that not only were a few threads stripped on the top of the gas tank, but the bolts that came with the gas cap were way too short. So I went to Home Depot and got a few different lengths of the equivalent SAE bolt, but I believe it's ever so slightly wider, so it would essentially chase down the threads, tap it back into having enough bite for the bolts. K100s had the tendency to boil gasoline and lose power because BMW didn't really have much control over the heat that the top of the brick would waft. Since my bike is fully unclothed and has no airbox to retain heat, I imagine that it's not too important. What sucks is that replacing a full set of this under tank insulation would cost 75 bucks and no I'm not doing that. So I'll just use the middle strip since it also doubles as a cushion for the tank resting on the frame and I'll just chuck the other pieces. Next up, the horn. They say that keeping a messy living or workspace contributes to that feeling of being lost, so let's go ahead and fix that. Right, so the oil pressure light. The oil pressure light wire runs from the outside of the oil pump through a hollow space in the pump, into the timing sensor cover, and out of the top of the brick. It's very simple. When there's no oil pressure in the pump to push on the switch mechanism, the little switch in there will ground the wire connection against the block itself, allowing an indicator light to come on that is connected to the switch on the ground side. The indicator that I planned to use was naturally the red one meant to denote the mandatory cup of ketchup on the side to enjoy with your fried piston rings. Or it just means to stop the fucking bike before that happens. The power wires are obviously color coded on that Cognito triple tree, but the grounds were all black so I would have to find the ground for the red LED. This is a connection that goes between the running gear and the frame so it would need a connector to be slopped between them for easy disconnection when removing the frame from the running gear. Again, this is the ground for the red indicator light going down to the oil pressure switch. Notice the body of the switch is plastic so you don't get a short ground signal. Now here's a demonstration. The running gear itself is grounded to battery negative, and I just quickly extended the power side of the red indicator with unmelted solder wire. The bike is off so there should be no pressure, therefore the light should be grounded. There you go. When the engine is running, the light should come off. I will plug my uh, ground dependent indicator lights into the auxiliary output. And since we're on electronics, why not replace that starter relay? Brand new starter relay for 70 bucks. This time, instead of running a battery cable all the way from the battery to the relay, I just piggybacked off of the M unit on the hot side.
My next goal was to do the neutral light, which was something I was on the fence about anyway. Basically, it was between a gas light and a neutral light, because I'm limited on LEDs. Yep, screw it, let's go with the gas light. I know how to ride a bike, so I know what neutral feels like. So there's the green indicator. With the gas tank connections, you have four wires. The green power wire, brown ground, and also a white and yellow wire, which serve as the grounds for the indicator lights uh, in the same way that the oil pressure switch did. One is for seven liters of fuel, one is for four liters of fuel. So here's a test setup. The main gas tank brown ground is at battery negative. The green wire of the LED is plugged into battery positive for power. The white wire, which is either the seven liter or four liter ground, I forget at the moment, is connected to the ground side of the LED. The tank is empty, so naturally, the light comes on. But if I flip the tank, which lifts up the float arm, the light goes off. You can hear the little float ball hitting the ends of the travel at each point. Now, just imagine gas going into the tank and making the ball float. At some point in that floating range, which is calibrated to either be seven or four liters, the light gets grounded. I had made a more permanent tank wire setup with connectors for the whole system to be easily dismounted. I also started to experiment with uh, mounting an integrated tail light for the last job of the day, but it turned out to be in vain because I wasn't a fan of how it looked. Okay, a lot of good work had gotten done that day, but it was getting dark once again, so it was time to pack up. The funny thing is, this was actually supposed to be the end of this episode. Like, I was satisfied with everything that I had done, and the rest could be left for another Bits and Bobs episode, and everything would be fine in the world. But nah, I just kept fucking going through the next days. I had finalized most of the electrical connections off camera. Things like the keyless ignition wiring, uh, the fuel pump to the ignition out, uh, making ground connections, the radiator fan button, etc. The next thing was to fill the brakes with fluid and also wire up the brake light switches. These master cylinders come with an integrated reservoir, which makes them look super clean. The problem is that not only is the reservoir quite tiny, but it's also slanted forward, so bleeding the rear brake is an actual pain. I was planning to run a rear brake switch, but I didn't for three reasons. Number one, I didn't like how the wires looked running up from the rear sets to the frame like that. Two, the emulator is kind of annoying when it comes to that because you have to splice two wires to fit into the space of one wire or make a connector since there's only uh, one brake input, which would add clutter to the already tight space that's under the tank for these wires. Three, the only time you're ever really using a rear brake only is when you're being a hooligan. You're always using both brakes if you're riding properly. And the front brake switch is wired up, so that would cover me.
The sun, in familiar fashion, was beginning to set, so once again I had to pack it all in. The throttle cable was installed, but the next day I would just have to dremel off the, the metal left from my solder job. I don't have a solder pot, so I just had to bombard the cable with all the solder wire in the world and just worry about cleaning it up later. Now this was a pretty good video stopping point too, but no, once again I just kept going. The next day, I got onto the crankshaft seal. So I'm sure you remember that I mentioned this seal earlier in this video. This is the later generation Teflon style seal. Why they switched to this seal design? Well I hear it lasts longer than the old style seal. And that's all well and good, but turns out it's very easy to incorrectly install this seal. So do you see how this seal has a sort of lip on the inside that's curling around the socket? Well it doesn't come like that. When you get it, the lip is actually a straight circle. But when you install it, it stretches and forms around the shape of whatever is slipping over. In this case, it's the socket, but on the bike, it's the outer crank journal that the timing sensor reads. Now the tricky part is that the lips must curl inward, inward towards the engine. So imagine at the top of the socket, the end that you see on the top is the inside of the engine. And the bottom side of the socket where my hand is, is the outside of the engine. This is how it should look, like this is the correct way to install it. So imagine you're pressing in the seal from the outside of the engine while the timing chain cover is mounted. The natural reaction for the Teflon lip is to curl outward as it, sli it slides over the crank journal, right? So you kind of picture that. If you press it on, the lip is going to go outward. It's not going to curl inward. But if it does that and you leave it like that, it will leak like no tomorrow. Now BMW makes a tool to install this seal, but I read online that a guy actually used old 35mm film canisters to preform the seal lip to curl inward before he installed it on the bike. And since it was the same diameter as the, the R bike crank, it worked just fine. So he did that and he quickly like banged it onto the onto the crank. So <laughs> I ordered 40 of them. Yeah, I only needed one, but that's not how Amazon works. But fortunately, the canisters are not the same size as the K-Bike crank, which I thought maybe there would be some kind of interchangeable interchangeability there between R and K-Bikes, but no. So that turned out to be entirely useless, so I was sitting on 40 film canisters that I have no use for. So that's when I had this idea to use a socket to preform the lip. Same principle, but the socket is actually the right size. Then I got an even larger socket that could fit around the perimeter of the seal. So basically, I could knock the seal onto the crank before the lips curled back outward. Jackpot. The lip of the seal is curled to the inside of the engine, so now I can simply just drive the seal the rest of the way in. I have no reason to think that this will leak, but I will pop the cover off in the next episode to see if it does after I run the bike a few times. If you're in a situation, you can either use this method at your own risk, or you can wait for me to update you on whether or not it leaks. Or you could buy the overpriced BMW tool. <laughs> oh, by the way, I cleaned up that throttle cable end and it works very nicely. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great stopping point. Oh, and in case you wanted to hear the engine run in this episode.
The bike runs reliably, but I have to tune the idle as well as the air intake to make it run perfectly. This gadget's out there that make tuning the vacuum of each intake super easy, but I think I'm gonna go the DIY route with that. I took another stab at the tail light, but instead of mounting it on a subframe, I'm just gonna have the professionals incorporate the mounts into the seat pan. I also wanted to make the seat pan myself, but no, I just let them do that, you know, they could do it better than me. So here's what's in store for next episode, right? I still gotta cut and paint the fender, as well as finish the connections and install a Motoscope Mini, which are basically the same task. As I mentioned, I have to tune up the airflow of the intake, and the final task will be to take the frame and gas tank to the upholster and let them do their work. I already have my appointment set up for it too. I didn't write down the fact that I have to change the muffler, but yeah, that's implied, because I forgot to write it. <laughs> just gonna get a cheap shorter muffler and just call it a day. The second half of the list is basically just what I have to do when I rebuild the bike outside on the street. Basically a bunch of small things here and there that I, you know, things that I'm sitting on that I, sit, I didn't put on yet. Mainly rubber stuff that would be easily forgotten or that wouldn't make sense to take the bike apart, put it on and then put the bike back together in the backyard just to leave it in the backyard, you know, if that makes sense. Yep, so the next episode will very much likely be the last one. Definitely the last wrenching episode. But I do have plans for post-build content, and I do think you'll enjoy them quite a bit. But I'll get more into that at the end of the next episode. Thank you for watching episode 13 of the K100 build series. You just watched the illustrator. I'll see you on the next one.